Numerical analysis of signals often requires that we truncate these signals to a finite number of samples because, of course, we can't store an infinite number of samples in the computer. So we've been looking at truncation as the process of taking a signal x of n, multiplying it by a signal w n, which is 1 on the interval 0 to capital N minus 1. And that gives us our truncated signal z of n that we then analyze in the computer. The frequency domain, this produces z of e to the j omega as 1 over 2 pi, the convolution of x of e to the j omega with w of e to the j omega, where w is the discrete time Fourier transform of w sub n. And what we've seen with the rectangular window, or the window that multiplies all the samples of x of n that we're going to keep by 1 and the remainder by 0, is that we have these high side lobes. And that's a consequence of the sharp transition in wn. If we have a sudden change going from 0 to 1 or from 1 to 0, that generates a lot of high frequency content, which is represented in the side lobes of the discrete time Fourier transform. We also had that the main lobe width for this particular window was 4 pi divided by capital N. We saw that by increasing N, we could make the resolution or the main lobe width smaller, but it didn't really change peak side lobe height. Compared to the main lobe, the peak side lobe was at minus 13 dB. Well, this framework suggests that perhaps we should consider some other functions in here for Wn. And indeed, a wide variety of windows have been proposed with different shapes that basically taper on slowly and taper off slowly to trade side lobes for main lobe width. So if we increase the main lobe width, we're going to lose resolution, but by lowering the side lobes, we get increased dynamic range. These windows are also sometimes called tapers. And the goal of using different windows is to reduce the side lobe height in return for a wider main lobe. Now, there's been a lot of different shapes that have been proposed. And MATLAB, as of this point in time, actually lists at least 13 different choices. And many of those windows have parameters that can be chosen to give a, almost an infinite number of possibilities. We're going to look at a couple, and one I want to start with here is the so-called Hamming window. It's very simple. It's a raised cosine, basically. It's a raised cosine shape, and I've written the equation down here. But you can see that it turns on more slowly and turns off more slowly than the rectangular window. Well, if we evaluate the main lobe width as a measure of resolution, and then the relative side lobe height as a measure of dynamic range, we find that the rectangular window, as we've said before, has a main lobe width of 4 pi over n and a side lobe height of negative 13 dB. In contrast, the Hamming window has a doubling of the main lobe width, so we've lost resolution here, but the peak side lobe is down 41 dB relative to the main lobe. So we're going to gain dynamic range by using this particular window. And that's essentially what this choice amounts to, is that when you choose a particular window, you're going to trade dynamic range for resolution. The finest resolution is associated with the narrowest main lobe. And the rectangular window has the narrowest main lobe width of all possible choices. However, the dynamic range limitations of the rectangular window are often unsatisfactory. And that's where one goes looking for other windows. So I've got a few examples that we're going to look at here. I chose four different windows, and I'm showing the window functions in the time domain here for comparison. So I've chosen the rectangular window is in the upper left here. And then the so-called Hamming window, which I wrote the equation for a moment ago, is in the upper right. Now down below, I'm showing two different types of Chebyshev windows. One of the interesting things about the Chebyshev window is that you can specify the height of the side lobes. Chebyshev window has uniform or equal height side lobes. So by specifying this, we're directly controlling our dynamic range. The minus 30 dB Chebyshev window is actually has a bit unusual shape in that 
at the endpoints, we have this value of 1, which jumps up out of character from the smooth nature of the rest of the window. But at minus 70 dB, you can see it turns on very gradually and turns off very gradually. Typically, the deeper the side lobes, the more gradual you're going to see the turn on and the turn off. And that's just because you're making it smoother in the time domain, which is reducing the high frequency content in the frequency domain. So let's look at the discrete time Fourier transform of these windows, because that's what we're going to convolve with the discrete time Fourier transform of the signal we're interested in studying. And in this slide, I'm showing the discrete time Fourier transform, the magnitude in dB as a function of frequency. And we're just looking at the interval 0 to pi, because these windows are symmetric about 0. So I'd see the exact same shape at negative frequencies folded about 0. In this particular panel, I'm showing the rectangular window and the Hamming window. So the rectangular window, as expected, is a peak side lobe height of about minus 13 dB, whereas the Hamming window has a peak side lobe height of minus 41 dB. So there's quite a drop in side lobe height with the Hamming window. Looking far away from the main lobe, I see that the rectangular window side lobes approach about minus 40 dB as they roll off, whereas the Hamming window side lobes approach about minus 56 or minus 57 dB. So there's about a 17 dB gain in dynamic range here between these two windows. Well, next we'll look at the two Chebyshev windows. I've shown their DTFTs in the same format here. And again, the axis is in dB. So you can see that the blue one, which is minus 30 dB, has indeed equal side lobes at uniform at minus 30 dB across the entire frequency range. Then the minus 70 dB window, depicted in green, indeed has side lobes at minus 70 dB across the entire frequency range. So here we've got about 40 dB of additional dynamic range that we're getting from minus 30 to minus 70. Now the main lobe width, however, is quite a bit wider. The minus 70 dB main lobe is this wide, whereas the minus 30 dB main lobe is that wide. So another way that sometimes we talk about windows and their DTFT is that they're somewhat like balloons in that if you push them down in one place, they'll pop up somewhere else. So as you push the side lobes down, the, the main lobe has to generally get wider. And that occurs for most every type of window. So let's use these four windows in an example. And I'm going to consider a case where I have a pair of equal amplitude sinusoids, fairly closely spaced. One is at pi over 10, and the other is at pi over 8. And then I have a very weak sinusoid located at a frequency some distance away, at 4 pi over 10. So this is a factor of 100 smaller in amplitude than these two stronger sinusoids. So we're going to look at the two stronger sinusoids to measure the resolution or ability to distinguish frequency components that are close together and roughly equal amplitude. And then we'll look at how, whether we can see this term as a measure of our dynamic range. So we're going to use n equal 100 and consider the four windows that I just showed you, the rectangular window, the Hamming window, the Chebyshev window at minus 30 dB, and then a Chebyshev window at minus 70 dB. Well, in this slide, I'm showing the results with the rectangular and the Hamming windows. And I've sort of sketched the true DTFT underneath in the red here. And we have the two strong sinusoids that are fairly close together, and then the weak one some distance away. And what you see with the rectangular window is we actually do are able to distinguish that there are those two stronger sinusoids in the data. It looks like there's two components here. But the weak one is uh, somewhat buried out here in the side lobes. It's not very evident. And again, if this data were noisy, then the random fluctuations you'd see in the side lobes here would make it virtually impossible to tell that there was any energy at this particular frequency. Now, the Hamming window has a wider main lobe but lower side lobes. Consequently, it has poorer resolution 
than the rectangular window, and we can't really distinguish that there were two components present here, but the improved dynamic range allows me to pick out this weak component clearly from the background. We get a similar effect with the two Chebyshev windows. With the side lobes at minus 30 dB, the dynamic range is insufficient to identify the weaker sinusoid in the presence of these strong ones. The strong ones create enough of a shadow, if you will, with their side lobes that it just hides the weak sinusoid. And you can see as well, though, that the narrower main lobe associated with the minus 30 dB side lobes in the Chebyshev window allows us to almost see that there's two terms in here. There's a little bit of a dip in there. And again, that might be difficult to distinguish if noise is present, but nevertheless, you can see that the resolution is much better with the minus 30 dB side lobes than it is with the minus 70 dB side lobes. The main lobe becomes so wide with minus 70 dB side lobes that I can no longer distinguish these two terms components at all. However, the side lobes are so low that I have very good dynamic range and this weak component shows up very strong in the side lobes and be very obvious that there's something there. So the essence of choosing a window is deciding how you want to balance your dynamic range, which is reflected by low side lobes having higher dynamic range, against resolution. And resolution is improved as the main lobe gets narrower. So if you want to have the highest possible resolution of roughly equally strength components, then a rectangular window is in order. However, you're not going to have very good dynamic range. These other windows allow you to balance that trade-off.